Hello, hello. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar. There is people from all over the world. I am really excited to bring you two awesome speakers today. Uh, we are running a series of webinars on the topic of distributed organizations and remote work. And we start today by mixing two topics that we love, which is software and distributed organizations. Let me quickly start with a round of introductions. My name is Jared Chiba, and I'm the Managing Director and Co-Founder of Active Solutions, a management consulting firm from Barcelona. We have digital businesses lead their market with our innovation, digital products, and lean organization programs. Codurance, probably most of you know Codurance, that's why you are here. But for those who don't, Codurance is an IT consultancy which bases its activity on the principles of software crafted community. They help companies to establish and evolve their software development capacity aligned with business objectives. Codurance was founded in 2013 by Sandro and his business partner, Mesh. Today, they have become recognized leaders in the sector thanks to the application of the highest quality practices, such as XP and DevOps, which allow them to work with continuous and effective delivery processes. Sandro, who is, who is one of the speakers today, is a software Catman author and founder of the London Software Craftsmanship Community. Sandro has been coding since very young. He has worked for startups, software houses, product companies, international consultancy companies, and investment banks. During his career, he had the opportunity to work in a good variety of projects with different languages, technologies, and across many different industries. Sandro has a lot of experience in bringing the software craftsmanship ideology and extreme programming practices to organizations of all sizes. He's, he is internationally renowned by his work on evolving and spreading software craftsmanship and is frequently invited to speak in many conferences, conferences around the world. His professional aspiration is to raise the bar of software industry by helping developers become better at and care more about their, their craft. Jose, who is the other speaker, he leads and supports the team of exceptional people whose purpose is to accelerate organizations and to help them reach their goals. He studied computer science at the University of Havana, and he has worked in the software development industry. His interest in agile methodology started him on the path of helping organizations reinvent themselves in order to reach their goals. And he has worked in sectors like security, logistics, online marketing, banking, and holds various certifications from the Scam Alliance, as well as having years of experience with Kanban and XP. In 2013, he co-founded Social Funded, a startup focusing on helping NGOs finance their social projects. And the webinar today, uh, Sandro and Jose will explain how software is the, corners, is the cornerstone of this new era that began with the change of decade. Listen carefully for the sound advice and wait for an amazing case study at the end. There is also going to be time for Q&A at the end, so please, if you have any questions, write them in the chat. Um, Jose, all yours. And I, there you go. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard, for having us. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for their time and for being here. Um, today, we're going to be looking at a few topics that we're very passionate about. Um, one of them is, you know, how software modernization or the evolution of those legacy systems that you have in your company are, you know, is something that is more a competitive advantage than, you know, a, a cost center, right? Uh, we're going to be talking about how that, uh, for that to happen, you also need a strong team, especially in the current times when you're working remotely. And uh, we're also going to be looking at some examples and cases of, you know, things we've done with uh, clients in the past in order to illustrate some of the ideas that we're going to be uh, sharing. Um, we are very tight on time. We want to, we want to talk about a lot of things uh, really, you know, really fast, but above all, we want this to be helpful to all of you. So uh, please make sure to pose your questions and, you know, we'll, when we get to the end, we're going to have a, a bit of a conversation around all of the topics that we are uh, putting forward today. Okay, so without further ado, let's uh, let's jump into it. Um, the current context today is pretty rough, right? Uh, there is with this whole COVID pandemic, 
thing. There is no industry that hasn't been affected to some extent. There is no, uh, you know, person I would say in the whole planet that hasn't been affected to some extent. Most of us are uh, watching this webinar from, you know, the confinement of uh, in our homes, right? Um, so uh, it is a very uncertain, very chaotic situation at the moment, right? But among all of this chaos and among among all of this, uh, you know, context. Um, you know, there are a few companies in, that as our consumer behaviors are starting to change, they're able to uh, take care of the, you know, these opportunities now or capitalize on these opportunities on, on how people are behaving and how, you know, different industries are being affected. For instance, uh, one of the things that has started to happen is, you know, people are buying uh, groceries online, right? A lot more, a lot more than they did a year ago or when, you know, someone like Amazon had uh, launched, you know, uh, this kinds of, of services, right? Um, and this is happening all over the, you know, all over industries. Uh, all of the industries are somehow being affected, either because there is a diminishment in demand or because somehow they, they skyrocketed, right? Uh, you have things like Netflix is getting a lot of uh, uh, demand, let's say, right? We have uh, things like Zoom or other companies that somehow uh, their their regular way of operation is being affected either because they have needed to scale really fast or be because of the contrary, right? We really needed to descale really fast in order to save on costs and, and navigate the situation a lot uh, better. But from that point of view, what is it that is making these companies be uh, so competitive, right? Like, what is it that is making uh, these companies perform better than other companies in the sector and other companies who are trying to take advantage of the same opportunities, right? So one of the things that I would like to do is to challenge that notion that it's a matter of luck or it's a matter of, of money or it's a matter of, uh, you know, having the best talent because there are lots of other companies who have the same resources, they're Basically, all we are all in the same context, but we're not performing the same way, right? We're not uh, capitalizing on these uh, opportunities the same way. And I think one thing they've done uh, really well is they prepare, right? The idea of you know adapting their systems, adapting their organizations in order for you know when the context changes, and that is today, right? Uh, they're able to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. And this is not a new idea at all. Uh, this is, we've been talking about this thing for a very long time. We've been talking about digital transformation. We've been talking about, um, you know, VUCA context where, you know, there's high volatility. There's, there's a lot of uh, complexity, things are happening. You don't, you don't know exactly what is, what is what, but you still need to navigate. And I would challenge the assumption that Today's context is definitely different in, in the magnitude of what is happening, but it's not very different from, you know, six months ago when uh, the, the Amazonian rainforest was burning down, right? And someone was being affected by that uh, change, right? Or when a hurricane hits uh, the United States, someone is affected by that. And many businesses are affected by it. So it, to some extent, that context and that idea of, you know, transforming in order to cope with that uh, complexity and with that volatility is uh, is always been there, right? It's just that today it's massively spread, right? Like everyone is being hit by the same uh, thing, right? So, so it's leveling the playing field to, to that extent. So um, the other day I was looking at Twitter and, and yes, we've been talking about all of these things, right? But uh, it, is, it is somehow interesting how companies that, uh, you know, used to think of these things as, you know, digital transformation or modernizing a, or, or uh, software as part of, uh, you know, their strategy long term have now find themselves that, you know, they, they took too long to be able to do this, right? And uh, just to, to give you an idea, the idea is that today that uh, modernization thing is more of a need for survival for the business than it is you know a long term or mid term plan right the idea of sober modernization is uh, you know a nice to have is no longer there because it it actually means the difference between being able to cope or uh, being able to subsist in the in the current uh, context 
right? And just to give you an example, this is a, a short abstract from uh, the Goma Digital Transformation Survey that uh, Fujitsu started a, a couple of years back. And one of the things that I like about this uh, graphics is that it's showing that it's an idea that's been prevalent for a long time, but also the that a sector that we normally associate with um, companies who are, uh, let's say, more bureaucratic or very rigid or uh, in structure, like, for instance, a, a bank or you know, insurance or anything like that, uh, are the ones that have been spearheading this kinds of transformations and evolutions, right? They're the ones who somehow, uh, even though they're huge and they, they've managed to create all of these pockets of innovation and, and, and uh things that are pretty advanced for the time, let's say, uh, in, in order to cope with precisely the kind of risks that, they, that this situation is bringing, right? Another thing that I found interesting in this uh, survey is that uh, if you look at the different industries, the reasons to start uh, programs like this, uh, things like, you know, uh, software modification or digital transformation, etc. Um, although they change, right? And although there is digital in the title, right? Um, well, it, there is no technology in those reasons. There is no, uh, you know, digital in those reasons. Most of the reasons are business. And this is another assumption or misconception that I think is important uh, to talk about here because software modernization is not about technology at all. Software modernization is about business. And in particular, it's about enabling business to adapt, right? And technology in this case is a means to an end, right? When, we, when we're talking about software modernization, when we're talking about um, evolving the systems or, or adapting digitally, we, we're not doing it for the technology, we're doing it for the business. And I would like to take a look at some examples on how software, uh, software modernization in particular is helping some of these companies scale or descale or cope with the current context, right? Because uh, a lot of the time when we think about software modernization, we're thinking of, you know, technical debt, no, or, or dealing with legacy systems. And yes, this is a big part of that. There is a part of, you know, taking those core systems that, in which, you know, the business is, is built upon, right? And trying to extend or recover as much as possible uh, the value that they're adding, right? Because as the software uh, reaches the end of its lifetime, then it starts, you know, failing you, right? Then it starts becoming uh, something that is not uh, empowering the business to grow, but to basically slowing it down, right? And this is part of the, uh, the thing. And, you know, somewhere if one of those things, it's not, it's not like cheese or like wine, right? It gets better with age. Uh, sadly, that's not, that's not the case, right? But um, that is only a part of what uh, software modernization does. If you look, for instance, at uh, scalability issues and things like uh, this graph is uh, by the way pretty recent. This is how, a, in particular, WebEx, uh, Skype, and Zoom demand and, and usage has grown over the past uh, month or so. And if you look at the at the graph, it's you know, the, the growth that uh, a tool like Zoom, uh, in particular in the state, has achieved is, is huge. And it's been in a very, very, very short amount of time, right? Which is, by the way, not, uh, not being followed, let's say, by its closer uh, competitors, right? So why are these things happening? How, well, I would argue that it's because they're very prepared to scale, right? And they're very prepared to uh, let's say cope with that demand, and that way, you know, you uh, your experience as a user, you know, it's not like watching Netflix and every five minutes it, it freezes, right? That's not happening. It's happening to other platforms, but it's not happening to them, right? Um, but you know, with growing in scale, uh, you also get uh, to scale all of the problems, right? And it is no news that uh, in the past few days, there's been lots of uh, discoveries around security and, and possible threats that, uh, you know, a tool like Zoom in this case, uh, you know, has, has displayed, right? So um, that's something to, to consider. So uh, 
enabling not only the scale of the business at this uh, level, but also allowing for you know quality and actual security to to also be part of that equation is part of what you would want when you're launching a software modernization program. Uh, then we also have innovation, right? Like the idea of putting out new, uh, you know, identifying new opportunities and then acting on them, right? Uh, and, and here I have two cases. One is, you know, how, a, you know, some governments have, have jumped on, on the opportunity to say to try to tackle this uh, pandemic, right? Uh, and they've actually worked on it. Uh, and then the opposite, let's say, like the case of the um, governor of New Jersey who recently needed to ask for help finding COBOL programmers, right? Because uh, during the beginning of, the, of this problem there, uh, a lot of people went into unemployment. So many people that the systems were not able to cope with that. And uh, they were so old that they couldn't really you know, handle the load or, and now they need to do that when there's no time to do it, right? Like now they need to evolve those systems and need to scale when there's no time to do it. So this is, I think, a, a key uh, issue here, right? Like the idea of software modernization is not something that you do after the fact. It's something that you need to prepare uh, for and you need to be doing uh, already. Yeah? And then on the private sector, it's not enough with just having the innovation. You need to be able to put that in the market uh, with time, yeah, in a, in a timely manner. Like, uh, and this is another example of, you know, Alaya Care is one of the biggest uh, home care providers uh, platforms in in North America, in particular in Canada. And just in a couple of weeks, they managed to adapt all of their systems to a uh, adjust to the current regulations like for instance uh caretakers would need to take uh, a, a screener uh questionnaire to see if, you know if, if they have symptoms etc before they could even go and visit someone or allow for people who are um, you know sick at home to be able to uh, be uh, taken care by a doctor remotely through video conference and not only that it, it's not only about the software it's also about how those companies have reached out to and created partnerships beyond their own organizations in order to take advantage of those opportunities and stay you know competitive right so um this is only the beginning this is not gonna uh, this is not gonna end here uh, there's actually an estimation from garner that uh for the following year for every dollar in, invested you know it's expected that people will have to put at least three into into modernizing the current portfolios and the things that are actually uh, you know keeping the business running. So for sure, this is not something that's going to stop here. It's going to continue uh, for quite some time. And uh, the the reality is, it's not just the technology that that uh, allows for this, but also how your organization uh, learns and adapts. Uh, to that context. So this is where we're starting to move into our next topic, no? to some extent, which is, you know, how do you make sure that um, your organization is learning and that your uh, teams are able to, you know, not only assess all of these opportunities and, and change with, with the context, but, you know, do it uh, effectively, right? And uh, for us, and this is something that is at the core of Criterions because of, of the culture that we have. Uh, learning and having a culture of learning, not just individually, but as an organization, is, is a big part of that, right? And there's another uh, thing that we would like to, to put forward. Because specifically now that we're working remotely, what most people's idea of working in a distributed environment or working remotely is is you know the picture on the left right the idea of oh well i can do my job from everywhere this this idea of i'm at the beach having mojitos right but what happens in reality is that when uh, you go remote right a lot of the dysfunctions that you have in your organization they they just become crystal clear right if you were having wasteful meetings 
it becomes crystal clear. If you, uh, you know, if, if your boss uh, was micromanaging you or you didn't have a clear vision of what needs to be built or all these things that you could get by when you were in the office, that's not available anymore, right? So uh, what working in this context does is it makes it very, very, very visible, right? And in order to do that, you really need to have a culture that allows you to adapt, recognize what those deficiencies are and evolve that culture uh, to where you need it to be in order to perform, right? And when I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about, you know, when you get a group of people who, who are stable and they share a common uh, history, as this group of people needs to deal with, you know, internal and external factors, you know, like, I don't know, the, the, the next, uh, you know, the, the tribe next door or uh, hunting or, you know, all of these things, they learn what works and what doesn't work. And this is the same way that our organizations behave. You know, we know what works, we know what doesn't work and what works, we learn, right, from our experience. And we then share with the people who come uh, afterwards. And the idea of having a culture of learning is having a culture that continuously evolves to support that learning and to support, uh, you know, that, that growth that we were talking about. Right? Now, this culture doesn't just, you know, it's not just one thing. It manifests in a lot of different layers, right? Uh, it starts with, you know, the artifacts, the idea of, you know, the things that you can easily identify. These are things like, I don't know, if people were using Post-its uh, or were using Scrum or, you know, the, the tooling, whether we, you know, we, we work from anywhere or, uh, or we meet uh, one day a week, that, that kind of stuff. And what I see happening is that companies who are now in this remote step, right? They're trying to copy solutions, uh, you know, the, the artifacts instead of going, you know, a, a bit deeper and understanding exactly that those artifacts are the response to specific values or specific questions that people share no, on how they need to behave. And that the idea is that they are there to solve those uh those points and and then of course there are things like assumptions in your culture things like uh you know it's it's okay to you know if someone makes a mistake to i don't know um fire them or things like this right like that somehow are embedded in in the group mindset but you know nobody when you joined the company nobody told you it was like that it was just it's just this common uh share uh idea no so I got bad news there because the same as, uh, you know, software modernization, this is something that takes time. So changing your culture overnight is not going to happen. But there is good news in the sense that you can slowly help evolve that culture to, to help you out, right? And uh, the way to do that is through leadership because leadership is at the center of every organization. If you want things to happen, and I'm talking about leadership, not management, I'm talking leadership in the broader sense uh, of the word, right? So when you're talking about uh, getting things done at whichever level in the organization, how people behave, how people lead is key to making those things uh, happen, right? And the way that it happens is that people identify with leaders, right? So if you are a leader today that's having to deal with moving to remote or having to deal with, you know, guiding a modernization process or something like this, uh, and you're finding yourself uh, getting, you know, boggled by some of these issues, how you react and how you respond to those things is actually going to be shaping your culture. Uh, into what you want it or not want it, because it's something that is happening all the time that, that, learning process is happening all the time, right? So you are in a good position to be able to, to have that. So what can you do today if you're a leader and you want to help your teams uh, to some extent cope with this situation and, and perform, right? Um, we internally use the, a model that focuses on, on five uh, different areas, right? I'm only going to touch on three of those areas because of the time that we have, but the idea is valid not only for remote teams, it's valid for any kind of team, but in particular, if you are struggling with uh, working distributely or distributely, or if you're, uh, you know, any of this uh, context that we mentioned before, this could be very helpful for you as a leader in order to help your teams uh, move forward with that. And if you're going to focus on something, focus on the core, the idea of helping your team learn, 
right? The idea of uh, how do you uh, create an environment where even when you don't have the bandwidth that you will get at the office, people have time to, you know, take a step back, reflect on how they're working together, make sense of the, of the context uh, together, and then based on that, improve. Right. So that will be the main uh, thing that you would need to work on, because if that is working, everything else would, would fall into place. Right. The, uh, if you um, manage to create a space where, you know, there is trust and psychological safety and people can talk about what is not working without actually getting on each other's nerves right, or, or, or each other's throats, that would already be helping you uh, or guiding you towards that uh, towards that point. The other one that is really important is the idea of commissioning or clarifying, you know, from the point of view of a team, or from the point of view of this group of people that now have to work uh, distributedly, what is it that they need to do? What does success look like? No? What does it mean that they're doing their job uh, properly, right? Uh, the idea of, uh, of of clarifying objectives, clarifying a vision, whether it's a technical vision if, if people are working towards something, whether it's a product vision if they're so making sure that everyone is aligned about what it is that they need to achieve, and making sure that they're getting feedback regularly uh, and timely. Let's say is a big part of helping that team together with the with the space uh, for learning right uh, to move towards the direction of uh, performance let's say right um and then uh, last the idea of clarifying not not so much clarification focusing on the external factors things like uh, you know what are we building you know what do our stakeholders need what are the important things about this etc cetera, etc cetera. but more clarification internally uh, you know what is this team Right, like, how are we going to be working together? What are the different roles, that, and what does everyone bring to the table? Right, and not only that, but also focusing on, you know, how are we going to measure the performance of the work that we are doing together? Right, because uh, to some extent, these are all things that you can get by you know, without talking about in, in a lot of cases, right, when you're in the office, because when we are not aligned and something is not happening the way it should, when it, you can always go and have a, a quick conversation, chat, you, you see it, or, right, you can sort of uh, figure out that. And, and so, so I'm going to skip uh, through these other two, but basically they relate to how the team dynamics work together and also how the team engages with the rest of stakeholders and, and people that, uh, they need to work with beyond and outside the, the team. But uh, in general, if you focus on those three that I mentioned before and you keep practicing, uh, you, you know, you, you're bound to, to get better. If you're reflecting and you're um, clarifying those things, uh, you will definitely get there. Okay. And uh, I think we're moving now on to, yeah, let's see some examples. So Sandra, if you want to take, take over. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Can you hear me well? Yeah, cool. Awesome. So, before we even go there, we, we very often ask ourselves, like, why do we keep building those systems, right? So, in the past, we would say, well, when I arrived, they were already there, right? So, these big systems that are not, they're difficult to maintain, difficult to test, difficult to deploy. Um, and, and but now, like after twenty years of agile, we are still building those systems, right? So, why? What is wrong? What, what is still missing, right? So, I think that we got much better uh, with agile at uh, getting closer to the business. I think the business has got better in terms of planning their products, uh, their roadmaps, and and things like that. But the cooperation between business and technology is still not as close as it needs to be so that we avoid building uh, those monstrosities that we see uh, in the industry. So uh, let me see if I can move my slides in here. So this is, I was trying to map uh, three different things in here. One is the 
four different phases of product development, right? So there is ideation, there is a strategy, there is planning and development. And normally, of course, that this is for software products, this is an iterative process, right? You have some ideas, you create a strategy. Uh, with that strategy in mind, there is a high level goal. You do some planning for the next, uh, for the first steps. With that planning, you start working on it, you start iterating, get a shorter feedback loop. Then once you get more information, you go back to planning, so say, let's see how much we, we were able to achieve. Uh, shall we change our plan? Uh, you keep going again, and then at some point you say, oh, sh shall we review our strategy? And maybe at some point you say, like, should we uh, review the whole idea for this product? So I, I think that Agile teams nowadays, they, they do that very well, right? So if you look at the, the business side of Agile, normally you have, uh, here I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the exceptional cases. Of course, there are companies that are highly mature, uh, and there are companies that are highly immature. So I want to talk about the average uh, scenarios that we find, right? So, but now you have a group of product owners, a group of people with a vision. Uh, they have, a, they create a roadmap uh, for, for, for the 12 months. For that roadmap, they break that down into a few milestones. They take a, a milestone that might be one or three months, whatever that is, break that down into stories, and then start uh, feed that, that, that story to the teams. The teams do some, some high-level estimates and work on them. Every two weeks, uh, they have two-week iterations. And then every two weeks, they look at the backlog, they do some backlog refinement, uh, so on and so forth. While the team is working on the two-week sprints for iterations, the business is always getting the feedback to re reshape the backlog, to reprioritize and redirect the, uh, the product direction. On the technology side, however, we not always have that opportunity. Teams end up working uh, always within the sprint boundaries. And when you work within a two-week boundary, it's very difficult for uh, development teams to be strategic uh, with their solution, with their architecture. So we very rarely have the time to review the technical vision, the technical direction, or the, 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 the architecture of the system. So, what you're proposing is to bind those things together, the, the, the product uh, phases with an agile iterative approach uh, for product development, but also bringing the technology phases into this. So when uh, the business is, is doing a product definition or defining what would be the shape of the product in the next 12 months, there is a technology can, a technology can come in and say like, is this even feasible, right? So what we are trying to achieve what do we need to do to validate that? What are the technical risks? That is the technical feasibility side. Without that technology support, quite often the business plans, roadmaps and stuff, they are wishful thinking, right? So uh, people think that they, the, the business will think that they will achieve those things in 12 months, but when reality uh, kicks in and people start developing code, that, goes, uh, <laughs> that doesn't go so well. So, but if we try to align, so for example, we align the technical feasibility with a product definition. Once the business is creating a roadmap, then you can say, okay, so now that we understand roughly what you want to do in the next 12 months, together, let's try to create a, a, a product architecture, a product vision, a, a roadmap for the architecture to support the product vision, right? Those things, the same way that the product definition and, and product roadmap are not a plan, or at least they shouldn't be a plan, it's more a vision. That's the same for the technology. The product architecture is also a vision for the technology that if the product can keep going, uh, will, uh, if the product goes in that direction, that's the kind of architecture you probably should have to support that. And then as we get more specific on the product uh, uh, definition, let's say, so we have a strategy for 12 months, but now what we want to do is just say, okay, let's just focus on the next three months. Let's discuss more concrete steps that you like to do immediately. And then we review the six months, nine months, and 12 months plan when we get there. And then we need to do that, this, the same thing for technology. At that point, you start refining that vision that you have for the architecture to a more technical strategy, to a more detailed architecture. So how many services should we have? Should we use an API? What kind of technologies? Those kind of things. So one thing, the technology is always coming in to underpin, to support the business direction. And once you get into the, the normal sprint, uh, 
then it is much lower level decisions that we do both in the business and in the technology. So what this is what we want to align. And by the way, I'm not suggesting by any means that this is a waterfall process uh, or we take months to do those things. The same way that the business can sometimes in one afternoon, sometimes in a few days, sometimes in one week, redefine their strategy, uh, re refine their planning for the next milestone. That's the same for the architecture because there's no high commitment in there. It's just like ideas, vision, and you start implementing that when we actually start writing the code. So, so the, the whole thing about uh, software modernization, as Jose was saying before, we cannot just fix the software. We cannot just go there and start refactoring code. We need to re, re, uh, realign the entire <laughs> process, business and technology. So they are always working decisions together at the right level of abstraction. If it's a strategic product uh, decision, there is a strategic architectural decision to underpin that. So define the vision for the product, define the vision for the technology. So this is what we need to do uh, as we are modernizing systems. And again, we are not starting, a, you might be asking, but are we starting a project from scratch? No, not at all. Like if you take a, a snapshot of where you are today in your existing system, you can still create a vision for this the project right now the product that you have right now, so like, where would we like to be business-wise with this system in 12 months? And then you can do exactly the same thing. It's like, where would we like to be uh, technology-wise or architecturally-wise in 12 months to support that product vision? So you can do that for a brand new system or for an existing system. The process is exactly the same, right? So this is one of the things that, first of all, we would like to achieve, make the collaboration even stronger and closer than it is today in Agile projects. Uh, then, of course, that if you are going for, uh, to start changing architecture, changing systems, uh, we need to understand uh, what kind of metrics, business metrics that we are achieving. So are, are we improving uh, the business? Are, are, we, are we providing any business gain for that? Because like, <laughs> We should not keep just measuring sonar cube metrics and story points and stuff like that. So it's like, what are the, the, the metrics that would really that we think that would improve the business? There is a book called Accelerate. There is a, a wonderful book I, I strongly recommend that you all read that has a lot of data, a lot of science behind that. And they talk about four key metrics. And those are metrics that we use in our projects, mainly software modernization projects. One of them is deployment frequency. So how often are we deploying? Right, so the high performance, uh, as they describe in the book, they should be able to deploy uh, multiple times a day, right? So it's also important to, to, dis to distinguish, like if we are really deploying multiple times a day or if we have the ability to deploy multiple times a day. So those two things are not the same, right? So for example, I believe that uh, a development team should always work in a, in a way that when the business says, I want you to deploy now, it will be a matter of hours for us to push to production. But if the business decides to batch some functionality so that they have a release for marketing purposes or for whatever other purposes, then it's a business decision. But technology should always be ready to push to production at any point in time, multiple times a day, if possible. Right? But this is, what, this is the ability that uh, we would like to have. Again, some business told us, ah, but we, for us in a regulated environment, we cannot deploy multiple times a day. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. But do you have the ability to do that if you need to, if something goes wrong? Because that goes to the, the, the lead time as well. So when something goes wrong, oh, well, sorry. Uh, so how much time does it take for one other, once a developer says, like, I finished my code in my machine, what is the lead time for that code to go to production? So we want that to be less than an hour because that allows, uh, 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 aligns that to deployment frequency, right? So, but we have cases in certain organizations that might take up to months, right? Because they are working in branches and stuff like that and goes to QA and so on and so forth. Uh, so there is a lot of waste in that process. I'm gonna cover more about that later on. Another metric that, that uh, we would like to, uh, to measure is the minimum time to restore. So when something goes wrong in production, because eventually, right, regardless of how care, 
how careful you are with all our automated tests and, and everything else we do, sometimes things go wrong. And then, but how fast can you fix that? From my experience, doing a rollback in production to put the old version in place can be extremely painful, mainly when you have database chains and stuff. So normally what you like to do is have a maturity that if something goes wrong, you can actually roll forward. You just release a fix immediately after and push a new version to production and not try to do a full rollback of your older systems. And then change uh, failure rate, again, the amount of defects and waste that we have in our system. So those are four key metrics that I would expect you to be far better uh, as companies go uh, through software modernization uh, projects and stuff. So, so how, how does it work? So how, how do we do those things? We, we've, we've done quite a few of those projects in, in, with quite a lot of uh, large organizations, medium to large organizations. And there are many things that happen uh, during those uh, projects. So we normally like to start with the disco to discovery workshops. The, 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 the reason that we do that, uh, there are many people involved in a software project, right? So we have uh, from business, sales, we have like uh, product owners, we have testers, we have tech architects, we have team leads. Uh, so each organization has different shapes and different landscapes. So there are many different people involved. It's fascinating when you bring all those different people to the same room and you start asking them what do they think about their systems. So for example, you ask them to describe what the system does. What are the main issues? What are the things that they would like to improve? What is the vision for the future? Same, uh, different people in the same organization who have completely different answers to all of those things. So the discovery workshops is, serves to align those people. It's not only for us to collect data, but it's also, most importantly, is actually align all those different people. Uh, once we have that common al alignment and, and we run loads of different workshops, we used to do, of course, uh, up until recently, in person, and there are a lot of fun, there's a lot of very collaborative and stuff. And now, of course, during the current climate, we are doing all of them uh, remotely. Um, but at the end of a discovery workshop, what we normally have, we have a joint vision, a common vision of the, the, the problems. So first of all, there is an agreement on what the problems are. There is an agreement across all those people where we would like to go. And there is also an agreement in how we should start moving towards. So we create what we call a technical vision. There is a business vision uh, aligned to a technical vision. Another thing that, that we do is to try to understand uh, the value stream mapping. So from an idea to software in production, what are all these stages? And, and this exercise is one of my favorites because it shows uh, all the different steps. This is one of the workshops we've done. It shows how complex the environment, uh, a company's environment can be when when someone has an idea, all the way to production, all the different steps, all the inefficiencies, all the ways that they have in the process. When someone creates a uh, QA finds a bug, sometimes they need to have code freeze and all the teams need to stop uh, to freeze that, that version of the code that they are working together. And then QA goes for months. And then what, in the meantime, teams are, teams are creating new branches. And as they create branches, they are working on the branches and then the QA find bugs the bugs need to be fixed in all those branches and in the, 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 uh, the version being tested. And then merge becomes hell. So all of those things you can visualize in there. And this is cool because not everyone involved in a project have that vision or understand the, the, the problem. So, so this is also part of the, the, that initial phase. And then once we have all of that understanding, what we try to do is to create a technical vision. So we align a technical vision to the business vision. So we understand uh, the different organizational uh, structures. So how the organization is uh, organized in a way. So, so uh, what are the different functional areas that we call or bounded context in a more technical term? And we try to align the, the, the architecture and the business uh, to each other. Normally changes in one functional area, there are far more changes within a functional area than across functional areas. Of course, there are changes across functional areas, but normally the core of the changes they tend to be within functional areas. So it's extremely important that we align our architecture modules with the functional areas. So this allows us to localize change, allows you to, to assign work to teams in a better way, 
as, uh, allows us to for teams to have more ownership of their areas, allows us to do the you build, you run it kind of thing. So decoupling the architecture according to business areas allows those areas to be tested independently, deployed independently. Uh, and also we have a high degree of communication within a functional area and can we structure better the degree of communication across functional areas. So that's Conway's law and everything else. I'm more than happy to answer more questions on, on that. But that is uh, part of uh, the, the whole thing. It's, in, it's extremely important to have a common vision that unites business and technology. So now everyone knows where we are going. Another thing that is key to modernization, uh, to software modernization, is that we always leave the system in a state. So we should never stop the business because we're just refactoring stuff or reactecting stuff. So it's important to create a vision, but the vision is not a plan, it's, it's a direction, right? So now that we have a vision, we say, this is where we would like to be in the future. And then as we start working, we start aligning the work that we do according to the business priorities, and we gradually in, evolve the system towards a direction. But that's not going to be a straight line. Normally, there, are, there is a mix of strategic work and tactical work, because you still need to deliver a few features and stuff. Uh, but what you do is you start focusing on the main areas. So let's say this is for one of our clients that we were doing, right? So for some, they had quite a few big functional areas and campaign and spot were the most important ones. So the proposal was we start with those two and as we are modernizing them, we take an uh, unstructured monolith and start organizing that code, putting them together, adding the new features, putting APIs, creating the boundaries. As we are doing that for the, the, the main areas, the surrounding areas start to, to improve as well because they need to be rearranged to talk to the, the, the new areas, right? And then we start evolving those areas at all the way to the point that we could potentially, if we wanted, extract that from the big monolith. Now I need to talk about like extracting from a monolith and going for a microservices or a service architecture uh, is not always the goal. We have a client that I'm going to talk a little bit later. Uh, we decided to go with a modular monolith. So we kept the monolith, but it's high modular and we put, we can plug in the different modules, uh, but, but we kept the monolith uh, application. I, I can explain why if you are interested as well. I think what is important to say here is that uh, software modernization is not a, a project that you start and end. Like a, a software modernization is more like a continuous improvement program, right? So companies like ours can come in, can help you with the, the initial steps and, and, and the more strategic things. But normally the way we work with our clients, we start the work in certain areas and then we start handing it over to other teams and we move to another strategic area and another strategic area and hand it over. So, but regardless, if you are doing it on yourself, uh, on your own, or with help or external help, this is a continuous program, right? So your systems will keep growing, changing, and you need to be on top of that. Uh, and then just very, very briefly, like one of the, the biggest pro projects we have in this area is called, uh, the company is called the Clinical Works. They are one of the biggest, uh, uh, the, they are the, the leaders uh, in their, uh, in the healthcare industry in US. This should give an idea of scale. They, they, they have more than 850,000 healthcare professionals using their systems. They have thousands of prescriptions being generated uh, in, in, on a daily basis, more than 80,000 facilities, and the code base that we are working on has more than uh, 16 million lines of Java code. So that is the size of the, the, the problem. There are many other services around as well. So our job is to help them, of course, they are a highly successful company, 20-year-old uh, company, but highly successful business-wise. And of course, over time, because of the size of their systems, they have developers in India, in the US, 450 of them. Of course, there are areas of the system that need uh, some, some, some care, some love, let's say. So, so this is what we are doing with them. We are working with those areas, trying to, to stabilize those areas, making it much easier to test, to deploy, uh, to, to maintain. And we are focusing on some strategic areas. Um, so the approach we took was, to, they have a very large system. You cannot change a, a system of that size in one go. So basically what we did was, we, first of all, we had to validate the approach because the complexity of working on a code base of that size in a heavily regulated industry, full of acronyms and rules and stuff that we don't understand well. 
So we had to validate the approach. It's like, how do we even start this? So then after a few, uh, a discovery phase, we worked with them, with the architects and stuff, and then we had a few assumptions, and we did a few uh, proof of concepts within the code base in a very, uh, in a core area, but still quite small area. Once we validated that approach, then we said, okay, so now I think that this is gonna really work. Then we start replicating that. So we create a reference architecture, we stabilize that, put tests around, create the modularization, and then hand it over to their teams to start maintaining and improving. And now that same approach is being replicated across the system, and we are moving to more core areas and now working much larger uh, problems in terms of architecture uh, and performance and things like that. But that's the approach. We, we focus in one area, evolve, hand it over, move to the next one. So just to give an idea, just to run before the, the small area that we are trying to that we were working on to run three tests that include some database uh, would take like a, a minute and fifty one seconds and as you probably know us we like to test drive things so as you are making small changes once you run the tests so if you are really test driving code or making small changes you run thirty times your tests in a couple of hours right so so that would take like an hour <laughs> just to to run tests like. Uh, every two hours or, or per day, right? And here is per day, but to be fair, like some of us were running far more often than that. After modularizing that and removing all the, well, isolating the area, putting the test in the right granularity and increase that to 12 tests against two databases in memory, uh, we can run now 12 tests in 3.93 uh, seconds. So basically like 30 times now can be run uh, in, in two minutes. So it's a huge difference. So, so imagine what you can do across the entire system. This is just one metric across a very small area. Across the entire system, this will be drastic. And if you multiply that by the number of developers that they have, you can see the amount of uh, inefficiencies and also the size of the QA as well that needs to test a lot of things manually. So. That's it. So it gives hopefully a, a flavor of some of the things we do and how our modernization project looks like. Thank you. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank yes. you, um, Sandro. Thank you, Jose. So we have a few questions here. And so let's go uh, by inverse order. So it's easier for me. Um, so first one, it's uh, Nikos. Sandro, would you propose a methodology to identify the boundaries that will lead to either the extraction of microservices or, a, or the modules of a modular monolith? Yeah, so so we, we have like, a, there are many different types of workshops that you can run uh, to identify uh, those functional areas. And I, I can see a, a, a person being cheeky here asking if he heard about domain driven design. Certainly, of course we did. Uh, so. Uh, I prefer the name uh, functional area uh, because it, it's more bis uh, appeals more to business. And it's much easier to relate. But if you prefer to call it bounded context, it, it's almost the same thing, right? So, and you can define bounded context or functional areas in this case, as I said, in many different ways. You have like uh, event storming. Uh, you have functional mapping. You have like uh, so many different workshops uh, to identify that. We run ones that we prefer because the kind of diversity of people that we bring to those workshops, but there are many different ones. Uh, but the idea is to organize your architecture according to, in this case, bounded context, understand the dependence across bounded contexts. That is a strategic side of domain-driven design on the Eric Evans book in 2004. Uh, I just prefer call to call it functional areas. Yeah. Also, uh, it's, it's part of the initial step when you're trying to get everyone aligned around what it is that we're trying to achieve and which, you know, which areas are exactly the ones that you would like to prioritize. Because the, a, a big mistake that people do is they try to uh, tackle a lot of stuff uh, at the same time. And not all of that stuff may be uh, important, at least not at the beginning, right? So that also helps you not only gain clarity in, in what it is that you need to be uh, building, but also what are the priorities in, in the different uh, domains no? that, that you're trying to talk about. Cool. Another question. Ozan says, uh, uh, it's not exactly a question, but uh, 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 more, more of what you said, which is, 
uh, modular monolith sounds interesting and would be great to hear more about it. So if you could expand a little bit the concept of modular monolith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the modules can be defined at many different levels, right? It's a very broad term. It can be a group of services, for example, a bounded context can be divided in a bunch of services, right? So, or you can have single service per bounded context, but they are all modules, uh, different levels. One in an enterprise architecture will be a bunch of services a module, but a class can be a module. So, in this case, uh, the reason that we went for a, a modular monolith is because of the production environments that this company has. Uh, this company has more than 14,000 installations of their software. Because they're in a regulated environment, uh, they cannot share databases across clients. They cannot be what we call multi-tenant. They need to be multi-instance. So, and they also install not only on cloud, so even in the cloud, each client will have its own uh, area of the public cloud, but they also have the system installed on premise. So they need to install the system in their client uh, uh, machines uh, and data centers. So a microservice approach would make the production environment extremely complex to deal with. So it made more sense to keep a monolith, but have like for example, this is a Java application. So we have now, we are modularizing with jar files. So we have sub modules in Gradle and each module is a jar file. So we, they are separate projects in a way. Uh, and, and the components are inside jar files but we bundle everything together to deploy them. And that's what we are calling a, a modular monolith. Okay. Um, more questions here down. Um, this one, um, um, interesting one. I don't know how it applies to the, the, the chat, but uh, I, will, I will send it anyway. So in your opinion, this is from Javier, in your opinion for big companies, is it better safe or scrum? <laughs> I think I'll let Jose go for this one. Well, it depends on, on what you're trying to solve, right? Like, it, it basically, there's no right answer to, to that uh, question. Uh, and of course, you can have preferences, right, on, on the different flavors of, of scale, agile uh, flavors, right? Uh, but the idea would be more like, what is it that you're trying to solve? Right, and and then based on that, you know, pick the tools that you need instead of just going with you know something just because you're big or or uh, you know just someone recommended it. Right, like it needs to fit your context. And going back to some of the things that I explained, uh, this is exactly the same case as you know people going remote and trying to copy the solutions that I don't know uh, GitHub or Buffer, who companies that are completely remote, they've already been doing this stuff for a very long time. They are using specific things and just trying to copy that. And uh, that's a mistake because you're basically copying a solution when you don't even know what the question is. Right. So figure out what it is that you're trying to achieve and maybe safe is not the answer. Right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's that's that's the idea. And uh, I have a question on my own about that, because uh, this is something that we find regularly. And, and I think it's, it's, um, it's a mistake. So when, you know, these agile gurus and agile consultancies go into companies and try to like to push a process that is not fit for the technology infrastructure that lies behind. So, hey guys, you from now on, you're gonna be delivering twice a week, something like that, or, or twice a month, whatever. But then the engineers say, hey, what the hell is going on here? It's, it's, we, we, we are moving from delivering twice a year to delivering twice a month. We cannot do, we, we cannot do that. What is, uh, what is your approach when you find that situation? It's um, how do you combine the, the continuous evolution of the process with the continuous evolution of the technology? Well, the, the thing is, you need to start where people are, you know, like you can just come in and, you know, barge in and say, now we're going to change everything. This is So you need to start where people are right now, right? And and for that, there are certain tools that are better than, than others, like for instance, Kanban or things like this. But the idea is that if you start where they are and you're already moving in the direction that they want to be, and this is why, you know, having a clear vision of where you want to be, you know, technically as, as a business, et cetera, is so important. Every step you take in that direction is already better than when you were, you know, 
uh, a month ago, no, where, where you were a month ago. So the idea is, you know, start where you are and take it from there, right? Like if we are coming in and saying, now we're going to deploy every two weeks, maybe that is not possible with the current system, or maybe that is not possible for specific areas of the system. So just understand that context uh, a lot better and figure out exactly where, you know, so because you may not even need it. Right. Like this is yeah. something that we do, we're discussing. Some some of our clients like, yes, the idea is to, you know, uh, reduce that time to market as much as possible. But there are certain areas because of regulations or because of certification or whatever that they cannot yeah. follow that path. You know, they have specifics, let's say, uh, release trains or they have to go through security checks or, you know, validate, you know, all these things. So to some extent, that's going to limit how fast you can you can do that uh, job. But there are others that are quite fast, right? Like they, they don't have to go through the process. So having that modularity that Sandra was talking about, having that uh, separation of the different areas and understanding that is where, where it becomes key because, you know, you may not need to deploy everything, right? You may not need to go through, uh, but, you know, that's that's a way to, to get a better return on investment on those things. And just cool. add a few things. Just one thing uh, to this point is like, when we are working uh, with our clients, mainly in those early stages, and, and that's the, the, the main reason to bring all those different kind of uh, actors or types of people into those meetings, because then we learn the limitations of the business and we create a vision that is shared across all those different people. And it needs to be a vision that they all buy into, right? And, and it needs to be feasible as well. So, yeah. so we never propose something that they would look at it and say like, no, that's not gonna happen, right? Because that's a waste of time. Cool. So we are uh, past the hour, but there's still people connected. So I, I assume that there's going to be some interest in the in asking more questions, and there are some questions still here. So one question from Mark early on when Jose was speaking. So um, question is, what do you mean by improvement meetings? Uh, any meeting or any let's say uh, reflection space that you have in your team. You know, if you're if you're an agile team, you may call that a retrospective. But if you're an operations team, you may call it uh, root cause analysis. You may call it whatever, right? So it really, you know, the naming may vary, but the idea is the same, right? Like you you're looking at how uh, you know you're performing as a team and and uh, as a group and reflecting on that and looking at the information and acting on it in order to continue improving, right? So that's what I meant by improvement meetings. So the, the name may vary. Uh, normally, if you're doing Scrum or whatever, you, you probably have one of these uh, each, spin, uh, each uh, sprint. But uh, yeah, that's the idea. It doesn't really, you know, it's not an agile thing, you know, like improvement it comes from way back before agile was invented. So, invented. so you know, that's, that's the whole idea. So. You know, look at the meetings that you have right now, see if there's anything that looks like that and, you know, start pushing it forward. And and also another thing that's important uh, is that how, uh, not only how effective, etc., but also how far apart those things are, because you're only going to improve as fast as you, you know, as you can reflect on what you're doing, right? And if you only do this twice a year, right, then... <laughs> Uh, you're only going to improve, to, you know, you only have two opportunities a year to, to improve, right? So if you really want to adapt fast, try to do it, you know, as short as possible and, and fit it to, to your organization. Okay, um, there are three more questions. One is private, I, but I, w I will ask anyway without mentioning the person, but because it, it's an interesting question. Uh, but first of all, Edward is saying it's a long question. Near the beginning, we saw that the finance sector is leading the way of digital transformations. But isn't that just because they want to get ahead of their competitors uh, who they perceive as doing the same? There is no implication that they are doing things correctly. And in the pandemic that we are now, there is no evidence they are reacting any better because of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I understand the question. It's true. That graph was not meant to say that, it, that banks are doing everything perfect. That's not, that's not what that uh, slide was saying. Uh, However, and we do have, uh, you know, some clients that are in the finance sector. Those are the ones that have had the least problem just, you know, jumping into remote. They were already, in many cases, prepared to do it. And, uh, you know, for me, at least, it was sort of a surprise. I thought it would be more of a more of an issue. Yeah? And then we have other companies like startups or, you know, who have had issues 
uh, doing that. So, so from my point of view, uh, it's definitely not a, a generalization that they're doing things perfectly. It's more an example of how you know that idea is you know comes from way back. And uh, institutions that, from my perspective, are uh, more used to managing risk, which is, I think, the, the, the important uh, point. And this is why, you know, the finance uh, sector in general understands that this is something that needs to be acted on before you have the crisis, right? Uh, and, and that's more or less what I was trying to convey there. Like, you know, that, that mindset of, you know, preventing uh the the issue in the first place is is i think very prevalent there okay there's another question more on of a philosophical perspective maybe what do you think the future of software modernization in uh, artificial intelligence machine learning i understand era will it be automated uh, i i i don't i don't think so i, I think that uh if I understood the question in terms of that uh, AI and machine learning will modernize the systems, uh, I don't think so. If they are going to generate systems, potentially, but then they will need to modernize their own systems. But I don't think that uh, they can just take what is in there and try to modernize. Uh, if that happens, uh, I don't think as I'm going to be able to see that. So I don't know. I, 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 don't, I cannot see that. That's when when Skynet takes control of everything and and, <laughs> and, and starts a nuclear war. Yeah, own system, right? Okay, last one. It was a private question, but I think it's probably interesting for everybody. Uh, Sandro, are you going to write a new book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing this already, but I don't want to press. <laughs> <laughs> when is it going out? When is it going out? <laughs> I'll do it like like George Marx. It's gonna be out when it's gonna be done when it's done, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I am working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So that was the last question. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Sandro. Thank you, Jose. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Wallace and this. Everybody's gonna get uh, an email with a replay link. So that link is gonna be on forever, let's say, so you can share with your colleagues and your company, with your friends, and everything is going to be recorded as, uh, as it is right now, okay? So, well, that's it. Uh, thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.